Okay, it's going. Okay, I think we got it there. This uh, portrait versus landscape issue with the iPhone as the camera kind of throws us. You have to do it in a certain order or you'll end up, everybody will be looking at me 90 degrees out of kilter. So anyway, all right, here we are again with the second installment in our uh, First John Bible study. And um, I've done a couple of things here that uh, I don't know if they'll work or not. We'll experiment some more, but I made the uh, font on the eSword Bible software quite a bit larger and enlarged the rearranges. I just have two different screens on the laptop. And uh, we'll try to see. You can let me know if as we look at the screen sometimes in the course of the Bible study, whether it's readable or not. But um, I'm not into uh, PowerPoint and all those kind of things that, you, that people do. But anyway, it's not, you don't have to read the Bible off of the screen. It's just that sometimes I'd like to show you some things there. And, uh, and that's an easier way to do it. So we'll see if that works. Um, I also wanted to um, feature another book, a couple of them actually, today. As we, and I'm going to do this, as I mentioned last time, every time that we, that we broadcast. I mentioned to you last time Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and highly recommended his um, books and lectures. And you remember maybe that I said that you can find his lectures uh, in the podcast on online for free uh, at the Martin Lloyd Jones Trust, and and uh, he is you got in depth, really sound Bible study and teaching. That's that's the place to go. Um, one of his books that he wrote is called Spiritual Depression: Its Causes and Cures. This is basically, uh, uh, actually you can listen to these because this is a series of sermons. You can listen to these online and uh, so that you can uh, um, hear him can, uh, actually preach these sermons. But this is a really good book and uh, um, definitely one worth having and, and reading through. I remember one of the one of the statements that I remember from reading this book that he says, a kind of a little nugget of wisdom, is that we must learn to um, talk to ourselves and not listen to ourselves. And you can, th you can think about what that means. We have to learn to talk to ourselves and not listen to ourselves. And that's a very good advice. So anyway, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Spiritual Depression... And then uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you. I've got quite a few books here by G.K. Beale. G.K. Beale. And uh, he's a professor, I think, at Westminster Seminary. But if you want to read uh, someone to, uh, who is... Uh, just an expert on the main theme of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, then that is, this guy is the one to get, G.K. Beale. Now, let me add one caveat here. He is so full of knowledge that he writes big, thick books. And the big, thick ones are... I mean, they're top-notch, and but they're so detailed that I think most people will probably get bogged down in them. Uh, let's see, I can give you an example here. Here's his, uh, here's his commentary on the book of Revelation. And you can see that it's pretty thick, pretty thick book. And again, it's, it's excellent. Uh, probably the be one of the best commentaries on Revelation that there is, the New International Greek Testament commentary. Well, 
what he has done anyway, I can't remember if I mentioned this last time or not, but what he has done is he did put out a shorter condensed version of that. And so that that's the book for his revelation commentary that you would, you would want to get, I, I would suggest to start with. Um, and so, um, let's see what else. Oh, so, however, this little book here, this is a pretty little book for G.K. Beale and uh, his co-worker, Mitchell Kim. This really, in a lot of ways, summarizes what that whole big commentary on Revelation says, and some of his other works as well. Again, if you would like to have a very good commentary of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, this is the one. God dwells among us, and it's a, it's, it follows the theme of the temple from Eden clear to the reappearance of Eden in the new heavens and earth in the book of, in the book of Revelation. God dwells among us. So that's, that's, a, that's a, really good, a really good book. And actually, um, I showed you this one last week, but essentially this booklet that I put together and with a lot of help from uh, other people um, really is, a, is an illustrated reiteration of what Beale is saying there. And it's a very, you know, so these books are really valuable because they give you the, the overall theme then of, of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> let's see, one other thing that I was going to mention, that's enough books for right now. I told you last time that we were, uh, I was going to be using the English Standard Version Bible, ESV Bible, and I am, that's the one I'm going to be using. But I just wanted to mention that actually, and I suppose this is just because I, this is the one that I used all through Bible college and earlier, but my, my favorite Bible is the New American Standard Bible, New American Standard, um, partly because you can buy it, well, it's laid out, it's laid out, this particular model, you might say, of the New American Standard is laid out much like the ESV that I'm using. It's got one, one wide column instead of having a couple. Uh, and then there's some cross-references in the column over to the, on the side. But, um, but the main reason that I like the New American Standard is because it's, it's what's called a more literal translation. That doesn't mean that it's more necessarily more accurate than the, than the ESV or others, but if um, people, for example, who study the original languages, Greek and Hebrew, they generally will like the new, uh, a more literal translation. And by literal, we mean um, it follows, it's more of a one-to-one -one translation of, of the words and the sentences and so forth. You know, you can't have a absolutely literal translation of, from any foreign language. Uh, if you were to read a, uh, a word for word, keep the position of the words the same and everything, a word for word translation of, say, the Greek New Testament, it wouldn't make any sense. It, it wouldn't uh, at, at all. And, and uh, so everybody has to um, translate the main thoughts they have. You know, nothing, no, no Bible that's published in English is going to be an absolutely literal translation. However, um, <clears throat> the New American Standard is a more literal in the sense translation and, and people that want to study the original languages like it, but I, I just like it for other reasons as well. So anyway, that's just a little bit of comment, comment on, on different versions of the, of the Bible. So, um, all right, well, uh, I think that's all I was going to show you here. So let's pray and we'll get started. Father, we ask your blessing upon the time in your word this morning. We thank you that you're able to provide us with the means 
by which we can meet together anywhere in the world for that matter and to be able to study your word together and so we pray your blessing upon uh, your this study and we pray that you would do a great work in us by your spirit through your word and we pray this in Christ's name amen all right <clears throat> well if you have your Bible open there to first uh, John then uh, chapter 1 I won't spend a lot of time reviewing other than uh, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 4 again and kind of get our minds back in the in track here. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things, so that our joy may be, made, may be complete. All right, then, uh, we, and we looked last time at uh, the first, for, uh, first phrases, and, and particularly we noted the, the sensory words that John is using here, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and touched with our, in our hands. And, and we said that at least part of the reason that he's doing that is to refute uh, and warn his readers, but he's to refuting that heresy, early heresy called Gnosticism, which denied that God could ever take on anything physical, let alone human flesh. And, and so they denied the humanity of, of Jesus Christ. And this is one of the primary reasons that John is writing this uh, letter, the, this book, to to the, the churches, and so uh, um, heresy and false teaching has always been with us from, from the earliest times. Now, <clears throat> you'll notice at the end of verse 1 that he uh, gives a, a name to the that which, all right? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and so on. But then he says at the end of verse 1, concerning the word of life. Now, <clears throat> this word of life is another name for the that which he has heard and seen and touched. And it sounds to us as kind of a kind of a strange name, all right. But what it, what is he talking about? It's kind of kind of sounds mysterious. But as we use the Bible to interpret the Bible, as we always want to do, then uh, we realize that John wrote other parts of the Bible as well. He wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And, and we know if, as we read those other writings, especially the Gospel of John, that we find out that, that these words, word and life, uh, in this term, word of life, is, uh, these aren't new to us if we've read the Gospel of John. So, for instance, and if you even just look in your, uh, your cross-reference listing, in the side column of your, of your Bible, you'll see... C. John 1.1 1, 1 listed right there. If we go back to the Gospel of John and just read the first few verses there, as we did last time, because remember, uh, he started off in 1 John with that which was from the beginning. And we looked at that idea of beginning. He's talking about the beginning of the universe. He's talking about the Genesis 1.1 1, 1, creation. And that's how the gospel begins as well. In the beginning was, and here's, here's the term, word. Now it's not word of life, but 
uh, it's just word here, but in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was, in the beginning, with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so there, there in those verses, we have both of these concepts that are combined here in 1 John verse 1. Uh, chapter 1, verse 1, word of life. Gospel of John talks about, and it's obviously Christ. We know that it's Christ he's talking about. He, um, he talks about the word and, and life. Now, these are the kinds of words that we skip over or skim over and think that we understand, but I think if you'll just sit there and and stare at that phrase, you can think about it for a long time and still realize that you don't fully grasp it. Um, the, word, uh, the word of life, um, what does that mean? Does that mean it is a word, a word about life? Is it, um, you know, how do how do these two nouns merge together? How do they relate together? Word and life. And then in verse 2, in 1 John 1, he goes, he separates again. He, he just goes to part of word of life. He, he goes, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it. So, well, think about what a word is a word is kind of a symbol isn't it it's a it represents something so the word tree is not a tree but it represents something that is a tree but here we have something that is the word itself and so we think well what does a what does a word do? A word a word communicates. A, a word makes a statement. A word says something about something, and that's getting more down to the concept of what uh, how John is using the word word, uh, because and, and so in what sense is Jesus Christ? the word, and in what sense is he the word of life? Well, he has, uh, as verse 2 says, he has ma been made manifest, and we have seen it. So Christ, as he comes into the world, is a word from God. In fact, he is the word from God. You remember, Jesus would say things like, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So he is, he is the perfect word. And in this sense, he's a very unique word in that the word itself is the thing. He is, a, he is a, a, the word of God, but he is God. At, at the same at the same time so and that's that's why he could say he who has seen me and you can extrapolate that to he who has heard me has seen and heard the father because they are they are one and the and the same Christ came into this world to show us the father and to show us all that's entailed in the father who he is what his truth is and, and, and so on. And he did that for a purpose, which John will explain to us in a moment. Now, this word, the Lord Jesus Christ, this, this word is the word of life. And we need to think about that concept again. If we go back again to the Gospel of John, uh, verse or chapter 1, 
verse 4. Well, I, I'll back up to verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, what this, what this phrase, the word of life, means, and we're still not plumbing the depths of it completely by any means, but what it means is, in respect to life, is that this is the life-giving word. This is the one who not only shows us the Father perfectly, because he and the Father are one, but also he is the source of life. He is the one who gives all life. He's the one who spoke in creation and said, let there be, and there was. Uh, he, is, he is the one, he is life in himself. No one gives him life. He, he, is, he is life. And, and, uh, and so John is saying that this incredible thing, this word who, get, who reveals the Father to us, who is, is God, and who is the source of all life, has come into this world, and it wasn't just some kind of a concept or a philosophy, but it was something that um, could be heard, that could be seen, that could be touched, and therefore, as we as we see, as we know, this is speaking of the incarnation. Of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, in verse 2, let's look at verse 2 again. The life was made manifest. Okay, so in, the word of life was not always revealed. God had to reveal this word of life to us. And he's done so. That's what John is saying. The life was made manifest. We've seen it. And testify to it and proclaim to you. And now he adds another adjective here. Eternal life. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. By the way, that phrase, with the Father, that the, this life, this eternal life, which was with the Father, is the same phrase that's used back in uh, the Gospel of John, in the first verse, 1-1. One, one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It means uh, at least it means in the presence of God. Literally, that phrase means before the face of God, in the presence of God. But, but um, it, this is just another way of saying that this word is God, is, fu is fully God, and, and always was. At the beginning, he, all, he already was, he already was there. He is not a created being. All right, so... John emphasizes over and over again that he has seen, he and his fellow apostles have seen and heard this, this word, this life, who, again, we know from reading on and reading in the gospel that he's speaking of the, of the, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, look at verse 3 now. That which we have seen and heard, <clears throat> we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Now, before I comment on verses 3 and 4, let me, let me just say, 
uh, I still feel a sense of inadequacy in what we've said about verses one and two. Those, and, and we probably always will, because those are, those concepts of Christ being the Word, the eternal Word, the, the life and being manifested to us are, um, well, <laughs> they're beyond our full comprehension, I'm sure. But at least, at the very least, we need to humbly recognize that we can spend a lot of time thinking about those things and asking ourselves some observation questions about them. And you know, how is Jesus like a word, but, but how is this word absolutely unique and in what way, what does it mean that Jesus is the life the, and the source of all life? What, what does that mean? Well, in part, it, this helps us expand on the, that thinking, verses three and four. If we all think about this concept of what John calls fellowship, okay, in verse three. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. And then he states his purpose, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Now, he's stating right off the bat here then, his, uh, his primary purpose, one of his primary purposes in writing this, uh, this letter, so that we too, the reader, us, may have fellowship with us with John, but also, and, and those who heard, but also with the Father, because, because John says, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, what is this, what is this business of fellowship? Uh, this is one of those examples <clears throat> of how Christians, or at least people who profess to be Christians, I often use the phrase, by the way, professing Christians rather than Christians, because in so many cases, people who profess to be Christians are not Christians. They, they, don't, know, they don't know Christ, um, which, by the way, is one of the, maybe the main purpose of uh, John here in writing 1 John. But Here's this word, fellowship. Um, in our church building, the church building in Tillamook, um, the downstairs large room where we hold the Sunday school class is also a place where if we have a, a meal or something, then that's where we'll have it. Well, in a lot of churches, they'll call a place like that the fellowship hall. And people, there's nothing wrong with calling it that. But you know, if you've been around churches very much, how much this term fellowship is thrown around. Well, let's get together and we're going to have some fellowship, right? <clears throat> the Greek word behind it is koinonia. So a lot, and you've probably heard that one too, and a lot of people will throw that word around, you know, uh, and they'll plaster the name, the label koinonia. Uh, maybe they'll call it the name of their church. I mean, coin in the air or, or something like that. But a lot of people, probably the majority of people that profess to be Christians, don't really know the depth of what that, of what that term means. And that, so let's see if we can get a better handle on it here. Um, John wants to tell us about Christ, about the word of life, about what he has seen, what he has heard. He's telling us so that we can have <clears throat> what he and the apostles have, namely, fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, we're writing these things so that our joy may be, may be complete. That is, it is... John wants to tell everybody that he can about this word of life that he's seen and that he's heard and that, he, that he's touched because, because 
somehow or another, <clears throat> it's connected with this business of having fellowship with the Father and, and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. How do we define that? What, what, is, what is he talking about when he says that he has fellowship with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ? Well, here again, and I don't know if, let's see here, if this is in your uh, reference notes on the side. Yep, sure enough, it is. Uh, if you look in the, if you have an ESV Bible that has reference notes, then if you look in verse 3, the reference notes, over to the side, you'll see it lists John 17. The Gospel of John, chapter uh, 17. That, that's where I wanted to take you, because um, I'm not using the campaign. Well, let's ex we'll experiment a little bit with the computer screen here and see if you can uh, see if you can see it at all if not you can follow along in in uh, in your bio let's see if mine has it here I don't see it there okay so anyway we want to go to John chapter 17 and there we go pretty speedy that's why these things are so nice but the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John is, as you can see from the, the heading here, and the, yeah, this is the ESV version also, is the what we call the High Priestly Prayer of Christ. And I won't go into why it's called that. You, you can look that up for yourself and, and figure that out. But if we read this prayer of Jesus which he's praying to the Father before going to the cross. The question of what this business of fellowship with the Father is will be answered, okay? So here we go. I'm just going to read down through here now, uh, John 17. When, I'll read it off the screen and scroll down as we go. But When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life. Okay, so there's a corresponding word here, right? That In verse 2 from 1 John 1. Eternal life. This life is eternal. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. Now here, here we go. Now it's really getting down to it here. What is this eternal life? That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see the parallel there to 1 John 1, 3. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, so far, we haven't seen the word fellowship here, but you can see, but you see eternal life here. And this eternal life here, instead of fellowship, it's, it's this word, know. This is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. By the way, here you see, that's the second time that you see the doctrine of election here, very clearly stated here in John 17. But, but see the parallel here once again. Jesus is saying that he manifests. He was manifested. 1 John 1 says that. He was manifested so that John and the apostles saw him and heard him and, and, and touched him. But in doing so, 
he himself being the word manifested or revealed um, the father's name to the people whom you gave me out of the world yours they were and you gave them to me they have kept your word now they know that everything that you have given me is from you for I have given them the words that you gave me. See, this is what John's talking about in, in 1 John 1, this whole business of the word of life uh, being manifested and he's seen and heard. Jesus says, I've given them the words that you gave me and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you and they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And by the way, this is why we Reformed theology people, Calvinists, if you will, uh, maintain that Christ died effectively for the elect, that he, he did not die for the sins of all of humanity, all right? but that he died for the sins of those that the Father had, had given him. Uh, verse 10, All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I glorify, am glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one. Now, now start to look at this language here. That they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, that's getting back to what John said about joy, right? I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, the word of life was manifested, John says, as you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. Now, look at verse 21. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Now, that's a, that's a mouthful, need, needless to say. But um, you see the themes here of fellowship in John 17, though he doesn't use that word. He uses uh, to know the Father. But notice how he more than once, Jesus said in his prayer, that he wants 
those who believe in him to be, and they will be, those who believe in him, to be one with one another, but also with the Father and the Son. To be one with. And that is just another way of saying what John is saying here in verse 3, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be, may be complete, okay? Now, this is a, a mysterious thing, but it's at, this is at the heart of the gospel. This is how, this is how the Lord saves us. This is, this is who a Christian is. This is, these are just ways of saying, of talking about what the true church is, right? The true church. What is the church? The church is the body of Christ. The church is um, uh, a, a body, you can, uh, what is it, Ephesians 2? We're all built on the foundation of Christ, but we are like, building blocks and we're all joined together or we're like a human body Christ is the head we and we are the members and so we're all we're, we're we are joined together by Christ to Christ and with one another and with the father and and John is telling us here that if we are going to have life specifically this eternal life, if we're going to have that life, then the only way that that's going to come about is if we are joined to the life. If we are one with the life, one in, uh, in Jesus Christ. So he's writing this, he really states his purpose kind of at the end, at the end of the book, um, well, he's really got part of his purpose at the beginning. But in uh, the last chapter of 1 John, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And uh, this is the point on which we'll I'll end. We're, we're out of time, but um, before Verla punches the button here. <clears throat> Man's problem is death. It's sin. And as a result, death. What happened when man sinned? He was cut off from fellowship with God. And God is the source of life. God is life. So man the sinner lives in the region of darkness he lives in the realm of death. What does he need? He needs light and he needs life. And, uh, and what we find here is that Jesus Christ is the source of that light and that life. How do you have this life? Well, you must believe in Jesus Christ. You must believe in the word of life in order to have the life. And the way that we are given that life is we're, you might say, we're brought back to Eden in this sense, literally in the new heavens and the new earth, but we are brought back into the Word, fellowship, fellowship with the Father and with the Son and with life, brought back to, brought back to Eden, you see. These are the things that he's talking about. And so when he says, I'm writing these things so that our joy may be complete, is that he, it is, it is a source of joy for John, and really to any Christian, to see other people who are dead in their sins come to faith in Christ and then be brought into fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And of course, we know that that chief way that that happens is that he is, uh, his spirit dwells within us, we're born again, and we're regenerated. Well, probably as always, I didn't get as far as I thought I would. I particularly was, I'm all set to talk about 
light and darkness and and you know as I read that uh, chapter 5 verse 13 and it said John said his purpose in writing is so that we can know if we have eternal life largely that's what this book is it is a a whole uh, set of tests for eternal life do I have this eternal life and my in fellowship with God uh, am, am I we would say am, am I saved do do I know him? And he shows us over and over again how, how we can know that that's true. And I hope that you will see, I'm sure that you will see, as we go through this uh, letter, through 1 John, and you um, carefully think about, even just for a few minutes, about comparing what John is going to be telling us here with what is being taught in most of the churches and what most people who claim to be Christians believe, you're going to see a, a real contrast that something, something is really amiss here. Who is a Christian? What does John have to say about that? Those are the things that he will be addressing. Well, we better wind up there. I'll pray and then we'll end. Father, we thank you for... Uh, this time together, thank you that we do have fellowship in Christ with one another, even if we're separated by hundreds and thousands of miles, and, and that you're, you've joined us together in the body of Christ. And, and we thank you that you have revealed your Son to us. And I do pray that if there be anyone that ever listens to these Bible studies and uh, that they would examine themselves and see if they really do know you, if they really do have the life, and if they really are, have been uh, forgiven their sins by, and washed clean by the blood of Christ. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.